Hi, welcome back with us. I am William Plumstead, and this is Diana Smith, and we are Universal, Universal Garden, Garden Solutions. Hi, I'm William Plumstead. Hi, I'm Diana Smith. I'm here with Naraj Ray. We're at the gardens for Cultivate the City. And he's going to give us a little tour of the rooftop garden. Thank you guys very much for joining us. Yeah, it's a little bit of a cross between a farm and a garden. Um, but as Cultivate the City, we manage about 12 different sites scattered around DC and we try to grow food on all of those sites. Um, this location is our retail garden center. So this is where we sell a lot of the stuff that we grow. Uh, we'll bring the produce back from. So first we'll start all of our seedlings here, then they go out to our different farms, and then we'll bring the produce back here as well. So actually we just got a bunch of Swiss chard, a bunch of different stuff okay. from our other gardens. Uh, we do a CSA every week, we meet about 60 families in the neighborhood. Um, and so that's our real goal behind everything that we're doing. Okay, great. How did you get started doing this? Um, I went to grad school in Florida. Um, my background's in environmental science, uh, but where I was living in Florida, I had a large backyard and I just took farming and gardening as a hobby. Um, when I got a job here with the EPA, I realized I had to sell everything or get rid of it. I read and about that, And so yeah. I had a garden sale. All the strawberries, right? Made, yep, <laughs> the strawberries were the main cash crop there, but I had a few other things as well. Uh -huh. um, but I basically cut all my moving expenses by selling my garden plants, and that's when I think, just subliminally, it's set in my head that it's something I should always do, uh -huh. um, regardless of how much space I have. Um, so when I moved here to DC, I missed having a garden space and I started a rooftop garden at the EPA mm -hmm. where I was working um, and that put me in touch with a lot of other community members that were looking to do similar projects and that's where the idea just kind of blossomed. Mm -hmm. I started working with more school gardens, um, I eventually started this retail garden center. We now also manage a rooftop farm for the Nationals at the stadium. I saw that it's um, what, like over 6,000 square it's feet? It's about right? 6,500 square right. feet. Mm -hmm. Um, we work with Gallaudet University, so I feel like we've built a good little network of sites and now our goal is not necessarily to get more sites, our goal is to grow more per site. Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of vertical, hydroponic, sustainable farming techniques, mm -hmm. um, and on top of that we want to educate more people on how to grow this good food. There's only, I only have two hands, there's only so much I sure. can do, um, that the more I can teach people how to grow their own food, the more the balls in their court. Great. All right, we want to take a little tour and right. also get your input on if somebody is a newcomer, like how do they go about starting to grow, what should they grow, things like that. There are definitely some crops and plants that are easier to grow than others, mm -hmm. um, but number one thing I tell people, there's two points I give. One, try and grow what you're going to eat. Sure. Don't grow stuff that you don't care about because you're going to treat the plants the same way <laughs> and you're just not going to get anything worthwhile out of it. So okay. if you don't like spicy food, don't grow habanero peppers. Right. It might be a really easy crop. You might get a huge bumper crop, <laughs> but it right. doesn't make sense if you don't enjoy it. Of course. Um, same thing comes to a lot of different herbs. Um, so, And also try and expand your palate as well. There are different things and different crops that you can, when you harvest it at the right time, it tastes 10 times different than what you buy in the really? grocery store. That's good to know. Um, radishes, I think, are one big example that a fresh radish actually tastes nice and crispy, juicy, sometimes mm -hmm. even sweet. That's our first, um, actually, one of our first uh, plantings of this season. That, and they are growing like the best out of all the things we planted. That's the easiest thing to start with because it's go. 30 days. 30 days from seed to yeah, harvest, okay. so you get instant satisfaction. Right. A lot of the other ones, patience, which is a virtue we're trying to teach to gardening yeah. as well. Um, radishes are instant satisfaction. Yes, so that's uh, probably why ours are growing so easily because we don't know what we're doing yet. Um, with radishes, one thing that's really cool is if you leave radishes in the ground and don't harvest it, mm -hmm. eventually they'll flower. The flowers make seed pods, mm -hmm. and I like the seed pods better than I like the radishes. We especially do them with daikon radishes. Uh -huh. um, in India, it's called rat tail radish, and there's a few other names for it. Sure. Um, but it makes a long pod. It looks kind of like a string bean, uh -huh. or sh it tastes like a crust and a sugar snap pea and a radish. Mm -hmm. Like it just has that crunchiness, but it has a little bit spiciness to it. And how long does that take? Like, um, probably an extra 45 days oh, after, bad, so about like three months.
take note, Will. So these here are both a little bit more than a year old. Okay. And this is my experience growing them. What I've realized is that the best way to actually keep them alive is to dwarf them. Um, for our climate, you don't want it to get more than three to five feet. Um, I have ones in here that are much taller, um, but you need something like this to overwinter that, and even then it's not reliable. It's hitting the top of the greenhouse. It's not necessarily doing the best that it can do. It's undergoing a lot of stress. That's breaking so out. Much you, better. So you keep them around three feet? Three to five feet. Three to five this feet. Was, this was my experiment for over the winter. Um, okay. that I cut them all back to one foot, and I just wanted to see how they all survived. They all survived, and they're all pushing out now. They basically go dormant over the winter here, and they look kind of scraggly. They look like just a stick. Most of the leaves fall off. Um, they and. For me, they've gotten terrorized by spider mites multiple times <laughs> during the winter, know. but it doesn't matter. They just come back nice and lush. I just pull off any leaves that don't look good, um, but then they come back nice and green, and they put out more leaves. The more I pinch them back, they'll make more side branches. More side branches. Are they a popular selling tree now? Now that I've been growing them for four years, four years and yeah. I normally teach an ethnic crop uh, gardening class. I teach class in the Smithsonian with the U.S. Botanic Gardens or uh, the Arboretum. Um, and so I I talk about this plant a lot and so I think I've helped create a little bit of a local market for people that are looking to grow their own food, be a little bit more holistic, be I think socially responsible about how they get their food as well. Um, right now the majority of Moringa that you get is coming from South Africa, some places overseas. Um, and being able to grow some portion of it in your own backyard I think not only gives you value for those farmers that are growing it, but too it also gives you a sense of agency over what you're growing and how you're growing it, the things that you're putting into your body. I'm finding that more and more Americans are suffering from autoimmune diseases, cancer, and all these different illnesses that a lot of countries don't even have. And you contribute that towards the food that we're taking in our bodies? I would say it's probably a significant portion of it. There's a lot of different compounding factors when we're talking about those. Sure health and illnesses, but um, a lot of countries, the diet is the main difference. Um, and as you see those diets change, like what has been happening in China and India over the past decade or so, um, you see the same health problems we've had here now cropping up in those same communities. Um, so I think it's a fair assumption that the way we treat our food has a significant impact on our bodies, our health, our public health as well. Do a lot of people come in here and look for different um, herbs and stuff for different illnesses they have and ask you for suggestions? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I try not to, I'm not a Expert certified on. physician yeah. or anything like that. I always give people a disclaimer that they need to do their own research. Sure. But plants are the original medicine. Um, that pretty much 95% of biopharmaceuticals are plant-based. They come from, they have mm -hmm. some basis in a plant Holy basil is a plant that I sell throughout all of the seasons. Um, and it started because it's a very popular Indian plant. It's a part of Ayurvedic medicine. It's been a part of it for more than 5,000 years. But there must be some reason to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, it's not all. Uh, yeah. Some claims can be overstated, and that's why I try to steer away from making specific claims. Mm. Um, but it comes down to holistic medicine, and plants are more homeopathic. Uh, most medicines you take are unidirectional. They're going to treat, for example, if you have a fever, it's going to cool you down. Homeopathic medicines help your body find homeostasis mm -hmm. right in the middle, whether you're hot or cold. They're going to help you achieve that middleness, whereas Western medicine has a different purpose. So mm -hmm. it's sure. I come and buy this tray and I want to use it for, you know, medicine and overall health. What do you, how do I go about, do I, Beat the leaves, like line up the leaves. Or? So you can use all parts of the plant, every single part of the okay. plant is edible. The leaves you can use, I know that some ways to use them would be like in a smoothie or on top of omelets and things like that. Um, it's packed with um, vitamin A, C, E, calcium. Basically, a lot of, um, I don't remember all of yeah, the sure. but basically, 
a lot of the nutrient packed foods that we eat, this is two to three times the concentration of calcium for the same weight as milk, things like that, where this is just a superfood. It has everything you need in it. Um, if I'm trapped on a deserted island, this is the plant that I want. It has all the essential amino acids your body needs. It's prescribed for malnutrition. How did you get involved with the tree? Like, how did with you find tree? it? Yeah. My dad wanted me to grow it. What I find really interesting is people think that you need to eat meat in order to get iron, and you need to eat meat for protein. They're it's misinformed. Mm -hmm. um, some of these different plants, that, I think this one is yep. very high in protein too, yep. right? Yes, it is. Is that in the leaves or is that inside the... It's in the leaves mainly. Okay. Um, and the other part of it that's really useful is the fruit itself. It makes so the flat the flowers are are also edible. They're slightly sweet and they're good for like baked goods and things like that. Uh, or the actual fruit pods. It's a long, um, looks like this string bean that's about four to five feet long. It gets to be about one to two inches in diameter. But when you harvest it young and tender, you can make a soup out of it. You can make different stir fries of it to actually get the seeds out of it. You keep it on the plant, let the seeds mature, then you harvest the pod and you can use the seeds in so seeds and the root are used they make a powder out of it and it's used to make clean water um, you can you have dirty water you stir the powder into the water all your, all your contaminants rise to the top you skim that off and you have a clean drinking but that's why it's known as the miracle tree all parts of the tree completely like that's why i said like deserted island there's without a doubt this You'll is survive with that tree alone. Just this tree. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. I'll probably need to make a couple more of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. since I'm trying to use it so much. <laughs> Explain to me the process as far as growing them from seed. Like you do a hydroponic, aquaponic system um, or just No, I plant? just uh, I just put them in a solid tray like that. I'll plant them. I'll first soak the seeds for overnight. Okay. Uh, about twenty four hours, then I'll plant them in a seed tree. Um, to get better germination rates, you can put a seedling heat mat underneath. Um, if you don't use a seedling heat mat, which I typically don't use, I probably get about 25% germination rate. Okay. Um, and then it's a matter of getting it to turn into a tree from the little seed. Sure, sure. The principles of hydroponics and everything that we're growing. Um, my soil is coconut coir based, so it doesn't have any nutrients, but it drains freely. You can't overwater your plants with it. Um, I'll mix it with rice hull, and that acts as like perlite or vermiculite, it adds the drainage to the soil. Um, and then I'll either mix in compost or lobster meal or something for nutrition in the soil, and or I provide the nutrients through the water through hydroponics. Um, for somebody starting off in aquaponics or hydroponics, we can't find anything. So where do they go? Do they order online? Do they like? Um, you can order some things online, but I think it's, in my opinion, a lot of farming comes down to ingenuity and working with what you have. There are so many resources you can use. You can find locally. Um, support other local farmers that are trying to get the like. If you can't find a one liter bag of clay pebbles, go to someone who's doing it on a large scale and has a big operation in your area and ask, hey, can I help buy some of your materials to help offset your costs in production? Gotcha. Um, things like that, where it helps build a community around that. And how, is, do you need a pre-made solution? Or are you willing to go out there and figure out what can work for you, how you need to amend it to work for you? And at the end of the day, that's what makes a successful farmer.